Okay, uh, great to be with you on this uh, last morning um, again. Um, hands up, people who have not been on the journey so far. This is your first session today. One, two, three. Okay. Um, so, as we talk about some stuff, there may be a bit of catch up to be done, but that's okay. Um, we've been on a journey looking at uh, um, leadership from a strengths perspective and how um, we embrace uh, a body concept of leadership rather than an individualistic or a compartmentalised um, version of leadership. I was meant to be speaking second this morning. So you know, when you're a speaker at a conference and you're second, you think, oh, I've got about half an hour to really clarify what exactly I'm going to speak on. And then Doug comes up and goes, no, nah, you're first. I'm like, oh, okay. So um, we were late this morning because um, Doug and I had a really long breakfast and uh, just really enjoyed sitting, telling stories. If you were here last night, you'd realise what a great storyteller. Um, yeah. Doug is. And so what we really discovered is while we're here with different, um, different purposes and different content to present, we share one heart and one passion um, for, for Christ and his, for, his, for his kingdom. And uh, that was immediately obvious this morning. And again, reinforced this concept of how do we actually deal with difference and welcome difference as part of God's design yeah. and not react to difference and I've been sometimes at conferences where I've been part of a speaking team and uh, you know one person says gets up and goes one thing and then you can hear the conversation I was like, well I uh, you know I'm, I'm, I'm not doing that but maybe they were better than me or maybe they weren't like this this whole sort of competitive nature even still within the body of Christ we often as leaders are competing with one another and therefore we are judging our value or their value and we just struggle to actually sit comfortably in the context of, wow, this is different, praise God. And how do we welcome difference as leaders? And how do we actually invite difference to provoke us as leaders in the cause of the kingdom? What I thought I'd do this morning before we get into the profile stuff is, is probably place some context around this from my perspective. And when Neil was talking about hunger and what we hunger for, I just thought I really need to, I felt personally I needed to place some sort of um, context around what, why am I so passionate about this concept of leadership from an us perspective rather than leadership from a me um, perspective. And Neil was talking about um, what are we hungering after and hungering after God and um, I've just I've been I've been back from the Philippines for about a couple of weeks and spent some time in some of the slums in Cebu City on Cebu Island in places um, like Lapu Lapu and Anaya One and um, and took a team of young people over there to uh, to do street feeding and to um, work in some schools and uh, we were talking about um, the Beatitudes as part of our discipleship while we we're over there and spent an evening one night talking about, you know, blessed are those who uh, hunger and thirst after righteousness for they shall be satisfied. And talking about the level of discontent we experience in the Western world, it seems like we just never have enough. There always is something more. We never have that sense of satisfaction. If you look at the exegesis yeah. of the Greek around that word satisfaction, it's that place of rest that's talked about in Hebrews, you know, that, that Sabbath rest where in our souls, in our spirit, we are so satisfied that there's nothing else God could give us that means we would actually be better off or in a different place. And so we talked about this with the young people that were, were there and we said, you know, what is, you know, what does this satisfaction look like? How does it connect with righteousness? What is righteousness? <laughs> You know, we talked about God's righteousness as being his son, Jesus Christ. He is our righteousness. And what does it look like to hunger and thirst after Jesus yeah. as righteousness? Yeah. But then we talked about that's not enough. Because what does it then look like to actually participate in the righteous work of God in the world? How do we actually involve ourselves in making things right in the kingdom of God? What is our responsibility in the midst of that? And the very next day we went to the, uh, the women's prison um, on the island of Cebu and spent some time um, there with a group of people who were doing some work in there and we participated in a service of worship in the prison. 
there were 280 women in a room that's probably about a third the size of this and they were sitting upstairs towards their cells and uh, the place was jam-packed. All these women were wearing yellow t-shirts, half of the t-shirts, or no, it was half, but some had the word detainee written on the front of it, uh, on the front and back. Others had um, the word inmate written on them. So the people who had inmate were women that been, had been convicted, tried and convicted of crimes ranging from petty theft through to um, child trafficking and everything in between. The detainees were women who were waiting tr trial. And in the Philippines, you might wait two to five years before you actually come to trial. And you may be um, exonerated from the crime and you've already served up to five years in prison for something that you actually didn't do. And so this place was dripping in a lack of righteousness. You know, from the perspective of people who've been tried by the law and convicted and know that they have wronged people, um, there's that sense of unrighteousness from the women who were, many of the women who were detained, there was a sense of this is just not fair and this is just not right. And in the midst of that, uh, a lady got up to, to, to lead worship and uh, a person started playing guitar and I heard praise erupt from that particular place in ways that I've never heard before. Um, it was confronting and disturbing. Often I find worship a great blessing and a great joy. I found their praise confronting and disturbing and all I could do was weep. Because here were people that were hungering after God's righteousness, hunger after His Son because in their world nothing was right. And the only thing that could be right for them was Jesus. And they sang and praised in a way that I've never experienced it before it, it it made some of my sense of our praise in the west look a bit um, thin but it was profound absolutely profound and um, i found two of our young people sitting outside on the steps of the of the hall in the prison afterwards and i went out and sat with them and they were they were weeping and i said what's going on i said we're angry we're angry this is not right I said, what are you angry about? I said, this can't be happening. And I said, you know, I said, we had this wonderful conversation about, well, where is that anger coming from? Is that anger you've dredged up or is that anger that you feel God has placed in you over this lack of righteousness? Is it his righteous anger? And, and then we had this incredible conversation and I said, well, what do you do with that anger? What do you do with it? Do you just sit on the steps and cry and be angry? Or is there something you feel compelled to do in order to actually make things right? That night we went to a place called Pier 4, which is um, on, the, on the edge of the harbour. And it's a, a shanty town that has hundreds of people living in, in incredible, uh, you know, incredible circumstances. And we, we went on a truck and uh, each week they go and do street feeding. So we had our group on the truck and they pulled up at Pier 4. We probably had 150 kids line up in about uh, five minutes. Um, they had cups and you know, bowls and bags and that sort of stuff. And so we then participated in this, um, in this feeding program. One of the team that had been with us who were wrestling with this whole thing about God's righteousness, what do you do with that anger? was standing there and had a little tug on her shorts and looked down and there was this little girl about uh, probably about two years old, completely naked, um, malnourished, had a distended stomach and so she bent down and picked up this little child and just hugged her. And we asked through an interpreter, look, where are, where is the, you know, where are, the, where are the parents of this child? And they said, well, um, she has no parents, she's a child of the neighbourhood. And says, well, how does she actually ever get fed? Well, sometimes people feed her, sometimes don't. Where does she sleep? Well, she'll sleep on the streets or she'll sleep wherever. She, and, and they said, there are many children who we call ch children of the neighbourhood. I got distracted for a moment. And, um, and when I went to look to find some of our team, I looked over on the street side under an awning on the, on the front of a building. And there were three of our team with this little child. One of our team had taken a t-shirt out of their back and clothed uh, the little child. Another one had this little child sitting on her knee and another one had a spoon and was spooning this uh, thing called legao, which is this sort of 
Ooh. <laughs> looking uh, <laughs> um, substance and was feeding this little girl and it just really struck me in that moment as I didn't look at the little girl but looked at what was going on in the heart of these three members of our team and I thought you get righteousness you get righteousness it's not that we hunger simply after Jesus but in that hungering after Jesus we hunger after participating with him to make things right in this world. And I thought, even if it was just for a moment that this little child experienced the righteousness of God, then I just prayed that God, you would actually take that seed and grow that seed to be something really powerfully at work in her. Why am I committed to body ministry? And why am I committed to this concept of actually shifting away from the concept that this is all about me to actually it's all about us and it's never actually about me. Because of my hunger and passion for the righteousness of Christ, his righteousness to be experienced in the world today. And if, it, if this tool or this conversation means that Phil Pinor engages way more in the body of Christ and the body of Christ then because we are way more engaged with each other and it's an all-in conversation that doesn't glorify Phil as a leader. Because I've got to tell you, I've been in places because of my strengths where it's been all about me, to be really honest. My confession is at times it's been all about me. And if you live and lead in isolation uh, around, with your whole leadership oriented around your strengths, you bring glory to yourself you do not bring glory to Christ. The only way Christ is glorified, if his body as a body is glorified, not if individuals are glorified in it. And so my passion around this is that if we have a conversation where we take responsibility for understanding who we are as people and how we then connect into the body of Christ such that the body of Christ is actually glorified, such that Christ is glorified and the body becomes way more effective and way more influential in actually bringing about the righteousness of God in this world, then it's a winner. It's a winner. If all this does, and Richard and I were having a conversation yesterday, if all this does is go, well, I've done my strengths profile and this is who Phil Piner is. Suck it up, sunshine, because this is who I am. Then we actually hugely hinder and diminish and suffocate the mission of God in this world. This, it is always about us. It is never about me. And I know having you know, led some churches, you know, a church of over 1,400 people, I know the temptation, the massive temptation to be seduced by status and position and authority and power and all that sort of stuff to such an extent that I lose sight of the fact that it has nothing to do with me. It has all to do with us. In fact, my leadership only ever makes sense in the context of you. You help me understand who I am. You help me maximize the potential of my leadership you help me avoid the pitfalls and danger and mistakes that i potentially will make as a leader it's about us it's never about me it's never about me and it's never about you either it's always about us you go into 1 corinthians 12 which we looked at on thursday night and it is a body ministry. I find it fascinating that the whole basis for instituting you know, the Lord's Supper comes out of the body of Christ where, as I said Thursday night, the Corinthian church, man, it was a happening place. Spiritual gifts running rampant. Um, you've got conversions happening all the time. You've got growth, massive growth through small groups and, and house churches and that sort of stuff. This was a dynamic place. It was also full of fairly high levels of immorality and a whole lot of other stuff that was going on. And yet the very thing that defines our unity around this sacrament of the Lord's Supper comes out of the fact that this local church did not get difference. There were super gifts, 
super leaders, all sorts of stuff. And even the context of that meal of communion comes out of the fact that there was a whole lot of people who came to this fellowship meal early because they were probably wealthy or didn't have to work. And so these were the me first gang. They come there, they have the best food and the best wine and people who come late actually miss out because there's not an us mentality. And Paul goes, no. He goes, no. He says, it's the people who are the most invisible and the most unpresentable are the ones that we have to lift up and honour and give respect to over and above ourselves. I believe that's true of my leadership in terms of my strength. I know my strengths. Um, No one needs to tell me about those because I've done some work around it. Phil Pinor does not need need to lift his strengths up. Phil Pinor needs to lift other people's strengths up. He needs to honour them above and beyond his own. And I've got to tell you, I could have avoided making some clangers as a leader if I'd known this stuff 10 to 15 years ago. And I'm not seeking to um, minimise what God has placed in me. I'm not seeking to run away from the strengths and the passion that he's given me for the gospel. I'm simply seeking to have integrity as a leader around the fact that as a person with the strengths that I bring, and it doesn't matter which of the four quadrants you're in, when you're aware of your own strengths, you actually need to focus on how do I bring those strengths into the conversation that because of mine, I actually find difficult to see. And that is the truth. And the story of my ministry is um, because of that top right, highly aggressive conductor. <laughs> Let's go, guys. You know, I've got the baton in front of the orchestra. I'm going to wave the baton. Everyone stay in tune and follow me. Because of that, there were people that were invisible. Their strengths were invisible to me. I did not see the value of the top left crowd, the realistic compliance group who you know, want the facts and, and, and the data and the information. They want to analyze stuff. I couldn't even see them. And see, the, as I said over the last couple of days, I saw them as being negative and critical and, I'm going to te- and, and lacking faith. I'm going to tell you, there's people in your churches who are in that top left area who probably feel like they have no faith because they're always asking questions or they're always, or always asking you to show them the money, show them the information, show us the facts. They probably feel like they actually lack faith. I couldn't see them. I couldn't see the bottom left group who are the supporting people who, who have this incredible sense of loyalty. And as I said yesterday, are the ones that read the temperature of the culture relationally. I couldn't see them. I just thought they were this sort of little sort of insular group of people and all they wanted to do was stop things growing. No, 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 no. That's what it felt like to me. But what they, the, converse, the rich conversation with them when I started to see them was, look, how are we doing relationally? It's no good you going off and doing these big plans if we actually cause harm to the connectedness of the body of Christ. That is actually abuse. Um, how, you know, I needed them to help me actually get traction on those things that needed to actually were represented change or we di- would disrupt the relational temperature of the body of Christ because change will, will always feel that way to that group. I sort of saw the visionary people, but I thought they were a bit thin on the ground. That's the bottom right. You know, lots of great ideas, but heck, um, <laughs> just make a decision and do something. Uh, and so there's a sense that because of our individual strengths, we have the potential to be quite blind. We don't see the value of these other strengths. Therefore, we judge those people and we do not invite them into the conversation that says, my leadership is done and dusted unless you are at the table with me talking me through this. And so, you know, my passion, I hope you hear my heart, my passion is for the righteousness of God to be experienced by more and more and more people in the places that Jesus calls us to go. The brokenhearted, the poor, the lost, the prisoner, um, to be in those places. And if this tool, and all it is is a tool, represents a conversation in which the body of Christ and our leaders embrace an us mentality around leadership. And if that means people, more people experience the kingdom of God, well then praise God. <laughs> praise God. Yeah.
Um, if all it is is another tool that goes in the bedside table and you know, yeah, I've done that profile, well, it's a waste of time. It's an absolute waste of time. So that's my context. So um, I wasn't planning on sharing that, but I just felt compelled after listening to Neil um, um, speak this morning about this hunger that, that I wanted you to hear from my heart about why, you know, why I do this and why I'm so passionate and so committed about it. Um, because I think in the Western world, we are so compartmentalised, we are so fragmented, um, we are so isolated, and the pastor's stats that I put up on um, Thursday night would indicate this, that at one level we have this conversation, at a deeper level, there's a, a very disturbing conversation around the state of leadership in the Western Christian Church. And um, yeah, I, I, I'm committed to helping people thrive and, um, and, and be alive. So here endeth the lesson. Um, <laughs> Um, okay, let me just check where we are in terms of time. Uh, oh, good. Okay. Are we able to, Dawn, have the slide that um, I had up? Yes, oh, Joel, Joel can probably pop it up. Some of you have got your maps with you for. Uh, keep going. It's about the third. Keep going. Yeah, that one. That'll do for the moment. Thank you, Dawn. Thanks, Dawn. Okay. Just in terms of recapping uh, where we went yesterday, for those who weren't here, and, and I suppose to reinforce for all of us, because it sort of takes a while for some of this stuff to really sort of gel. Um, what this profile that I, uh, that I work with um, through, again, an organisation called ministryinsights.com is a profile that comes from a ministry basis um, not from a secular basis, although they've looked at some of the secular profiling like DISCs and Maya Briggs and, and, and some strength finder stuff and that sort of thing. But it comes from the perspective of 1 Corinthians 12. And so the purpose of this profile is not to help simply you go, well, this is who I am, or this points to maybe who I am. The whole purpose is that it actually points to the us. It's a body profile. And so it's who is Phil Pinor in the context of other people? Yeah, Who is Phil Pinor in the context of other people? One of the, if, you, if you choose to go online and to do the profile, um, there's one fascinating, um, insightful section in the profile that actually talks about how other people view you. <laughs> now, this was, uh, this was disturbing for me because I'm top right, so there's this air of confidence, maybe this air of arrogance, about Phil, there's, you know, he's, he's decisive. Um, there's never any doubt in Phil's mind about what he's saying is the gospel truth or you know, anything like that. It's like, here's this guy and I thought, and I thought well, when I speak, I come across, come across as this sort of charming, effervescent, enthusiastic, passionate sort of guy and everyone just goes, oh wow, we could sit under this guy's voice for years. That's how I viewed myself. The interesting thing around the strengths profile is that if we, if we assume that God in his wisdom created difference to be a part of humanity and that these four particular quadrants and a whole lot of things in those quadrants represent God's image of who God he is in humanity, when Phil gets up to speak, not everyone is going to go, oh, this guy is just, <laughs> this guy's fantastic. And in the particular profile... There's some sections like, when Phil gets up to sell an idea, how do you think a supporter, a person, you know, let's just say, let's just say that Phil, it's a vision night. It's a vision night for the church. And so Phil is getting up and he's going to share the vision for 2016. You know, the elders have met. There's been a whole lot of prayer and discernment. There's been some conversations and that sort of stuff. Phil gets up and he amps up in his conducting strength. And so Phil gives the stump speech for 2016. So it's full of big dreams. It's full of let's get on board. It's full of let's have faith in Jesus because God can actually do this. It's full of um, we want everyone to be aligned to us. Um, it's full of this sense of Come and follow Phil because Phil's our leader. He's conducting the orchestra. You can trust Phil because this is who Phil is. And so Phil
Phil gives a stump speech. You may have heard some stump speeches or some vision speeches like that in your, in your time. So Phil gives the speech. Which one of those, and we've got all these people in, the, you know, let's say there's 150 people in the room representing all four sections of the chart. Which group is going to be on board right from the get-go? Sorry? Maybe. Sorry? Top right. Top right people. Those people whose heart and style resonates and connects with Phil on board straight away. Oh, this guy's the gun. This guy's the man. Okay, he's it. And judging on, uh, on you know, three or four hundred profiles I've done, that probably represents about five percent of those people are actually there. So I think that's really interesting. The second group that would probably connect quickly would be bottom right. The visionary people that are feeding off the emotion that Phil is actually placing into the mix because bottom right, um, those people who are engagers feed off emotion. They love the emotion and the passion that's a part of it. They love the creativity and the idealism and the ideas and they feed off that and so they're in. And again, from the work I've done, that's about 20 to 30% of the people. Okay, you're sitting in the, this, this meeting and you're, a, uh, you're in that bottom left supporting area. So you're processing this from the point of what? What filter is this going through? What do you think? Change? Security? How is this going to affect the relationships and my relationships in the body of Christ? Yeah, how is this going to affect this? And so what might, how might you be, if you were in this bottom left area, be viewing Phil or responding to what Phil is saying? He's, upset, he's upsetting the apple cart. He, he's upsetting the apple cart. Who is bottom left? Who's bottom left here? What would you be thinking? Get off your high horse. Perfect. Get down off your throne. Get off the platform and actually sit down and talk with us. Who else is bottom left? What would you be thinking? <laughs> I'm out of here. Okay? So you haven't even got past go because of that relating what about you? No, sorry, behind. I think the lady, sorry, the lady, I can't see your name. Kim. Kim, what would you be thinking, Kim? Or what, how would you be feeling? I'd be concerned how the other people are feeling. Exactly. You'd be sitting there thinking, I wonder how people are feeling yeah. about this. And so Phil's on the platform in full flight thinking, man, this is going really well. <laughs> <laughs> and there's a group of people going, uh, I'm not sure it's going as well as you think it might be going. I'm asking different questions to you. Okay, let's go to top left, this technician area. These are the people who rely and thrive on facts. They're analytical, they're insightful, they're deliberative, they are energised by rules and regulations. What do you think they're thinking? Heard it all before. Here's another gung-ho preacher who's full of big ideas. We've had 10 of them in the last 20 years or we've had three of them in the last 25 years and we're the same size as we were 25 years ago. And, okay, what else that might they be thinking? What's the cost? Yeah. Sorry? What's the, cost? What's the cost? Give us some figures here. <laughs> How much is this all going to cost? What else would they be thinking? Do you think? Who's top left? What would you be thinking? <laughs> How exactly is this actually going to happen? How is this going to actually happen? What's because the What's the strategy? Yeah. yeah, give us some details. How might you, if you're top left, be viewing me? Fear? What might, might, what might you, when you look at Phil, you think... Well, Phil seems himself as this charming, effusive... What's the catch, What's the catch here? Yeah. yeah. He's a con man. It's a con man. And, you know, incredibly enough, incredibly enough, 
I've heard that over and over again from people in that top left category when they look at and view leadership in the top right it's like what's the con here there's something going down here because we don't have all the information we don't have all the facts and so there's a wonderful thing in the profile where I learnt that when I get up and speak I don't need to apologize for who I am but I need to be prepared for the fact especially when there's really important communication or information to be shared I need to prepare myself for the fact that there's three other quadrants that are sitting in the room that actually will be processing this not from the place that I'm giving it, but from their own particular strengths. And I've got to tell you, that was gold for me. And so from that moment, whenever we did serious communication in public, the first thing we did was we held forums before the communication was given out. We had forum groups where we said, look, we're having a vision meeting in two weeks' time and uh, we want to give people a chance to come together and talk over some of the ideas that we're going to be talking about. Who do you think came to those forums? Bottom left, turned out in numbers. Didn't get any from the top right, didn't get any really from the, the, the bottom right, got a few from the top left, but predominantly they were people who want to do this through being relationally connected. And when you said to them, how do you think this is going to go? They would then go, well, we're a little concerned here because there's this group of people or whatever, we, you know, or there'd be this really rich conversation where I go, okay. And the moment I did that, or we did that in the way of processing decision making, when it came to the vision night, this group were in because they're supporting relating strength, which thrives in the context of small group conversations or one-on-one -on -one conversations go, wow, we've been a part of this conversation. The other thing I did was um, I always produced a fact sheet, always, because top left want to leave the meeting with something they can take away and analyse. <laughs> And so, you know, we would always prepare ourselves around specific pieces of data or information and we'd have a whole list of, of analysing type questions because we knew that the top left people would go away and they would spend the next two weeks uh, investigating and analysing the questions that we'd posed. Um, and that was gold because sometimes... When they come back, you know, and it was really interesting, you know, you'd, you'd have a vision meeting and you'd, you'd, you'd have a, you know, say, look, if you want a fact sheet, take it away. Um, bottom left people and bottom right people never took away a fact sheet. <laughs> like they don't need a fact sheet. But I'd get a phone call or an email from someone saying, hey, Phil, you know, um, I was, I've been looking over for two to three weeks the fact sheet you gave at that meeting and I've been analysing some of the information and I've been researching some of the questions. I'm thinking... Blimey, you've been doing that for three weeks because they just love doing it. And here's some stuff that I think might be really helpful in the conversation. Or, Phil, I reckon you might be, we're, we're, there's a potential to be tripped up here um, around some of the information that you've actually presented. And so I think as leaders, there are a whole lot of ways that we can actually blend things and do things well that are not about changing the direction or changing the decision or changing that sense of Holy Spirit discernment about where we need to be, but there's some process stuff that where the whole decision-making process becomes an all-in conversation rather than being led from one particular quadrant on that, um, on that strengths chart. And it is gold. Uh, it is gold. Neil? I was going to say, um, I think also the, the thing that um, is really important with that supporter stuff is that it's the time to reflect. You yes. know, that, you know, you said two weeks before the, it's yep. the time to reflect because those people are often extreme reflection people. Yeah, 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 providing the time. Yeah. Well. <laughs> <laughs> The interesting thing is that, and I think this has something to do with our theology around um, body ministry, um, that may be, I think, at times a little bit screwy. 80% of profiles I've done have been in the bottom left, 
When I led, led the church of 1400, I, did, I say, did I share this yesterday? Um, you know, I just talked about the fact that this was, this was a signature church in South Australia and a pretty important church around Australia. It had this reputation as being, well, it's the place to be. And, um, you know, I'd been asked, invited there to accept the call to lead them and transition them through into a fresh season because they had some financial issues and they got stuck. And so all their rhetoric was around, we are innovative, we are a go-getting sort of place, we're ready for change and all that sort of stuff. I, when I did this profiling, one of the first things I did was did a profiling with, the, with 150 of the key leaders of the church and was horrified to find that around 90% of the key leaders were bottom left and there was me and another guy top right. And, and so there's a, there's a sense of, because we are relational, as the body of Christ, at times we interpret that as being bottom left. We've just got to keep people happy. Um, we just, you know, this is all about relationships. I can't tell you how many churches I go into who say, we don't do anything missionally until our relationships are right internally. Um, and so I think there is, in some of our theology or some people's theology, this sense that to be relational as a community, means that everyone has to be bottom left. Which actually then produces, from my perspective, a toxic um, culture around relationships. Because people in those other three, and because culture drives everything, you know, if you're a, a high level sort of conductor person or an engager and you step into a culture that's totally um, determined by... Um, this, this strong, supporting, relating, loyalty sort of uh, relational bent, um, you either burn yourself out because you're just knocking your head against a brick wall or you just leave because the culture determines what is acceptable and what is not acceptable. And, and so, yeah, so about 80% in there. I'd say, I'd say statistically around, I don't know, 80% might be wrong. Let's just let's pull that back around sort of 65 to 70, but it's a larger group. The top group is probably about 10 to 15, but I think there's more, there's more of those people in the body of Christ than we actually um, give credit for. I think a lot of them are afraid. I think a lot of them are afraid. Um, you agree that when it comes to filling in things, answering things, yep. those guys, they're into that, where the others don't even want to do that. It's like, so you, you end up, I don't know, I'm just thinking... Uh, you said you don't actually get... A, a selective sample, representative sample. Yeah. Yeah. Well, c certainly in the, in the ones where I've done leadership teams, you do, because that does it as a team. So it's not like, well, who volunteers to do it? So I'm speaking these sort of statistics out of context of actually s taking teams um, through this that represent leadership teams. Yeah. yeah. It's like, for example, like Perth looking for a church to sort of get it, and you, you, you come two weeks in a row, and they're shoving a membership for me. <laughs> 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 yeah. Yeah, um, Hang on, let me become a Christian first. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's right, yeah. yeah. Oh, certainly the people I've spoken with and the hardest conversations I've found to have would be the people on the top left. Um, certainly there's an element of fear um, about um, and a perception, uh, as I said before, a perception around a uh, perceived lack of faith that says they'll often sit silently. And if you've got people who've got that strength sitting silently in your church, you've got an undercurrent of stuff that is not healthy. Um, um, so, yeah, that's, that's probably one... That group is a group that I'm probably more concerned about in the body of Christ because of the perception around their, their lack of faith. Um, so how do you tackle that lot? How do I tackle them? Um, <laughs> quickly. <laughs> metaphorically speaking. I think what, what I learnt was that, again, they represent God's gift to me and so I need to build healthy relationships with them and it came through just conversations. Look, um, can we, have a, can we have a cup of coffee and here's some stuff I'm working through and thinking about, what do you think? To invite them into the conversation is an incredible gift. Yeah. And to give them the sense that because they ask questions and because they zero in on you know, facts and figures, they dot the I's and cross the T's, 
that their pastor and their leader affirms them of people as people of faith rather than sees them as negative or critical or, or troublemakers, I think is a massive, a massive thing for them. Um, this is messy. You know, I'd love to think that it's as clean and neat as the model up on the screen. It's messy because relationships are messy and people are messy and I am messy. And one thing they talk about in the profile is that when you get in a situation of stress or under stress, guess what happens to your strength? Amps up. Amps up. And so if Phil, and that if you draw a wheel around that, uh, that, those four quadrants, and on the outside of the wheel you've got extreme expressions of particular strengths that fit in the wheel. I'm on the outside in the coloured line, which probably shouldn't read warning. Um, and so even under normal circumstances, people find me pretty confrontational. Um, I'm a lovely guy, highly, you know, highly relational, but people for some reason find me confrontational. When I come under stress, that gets amped up even more. Yeah. And I go from being confrontational to being <laughs> this enemy. Um, and that happens in every single one of these quadrants. And so um, for someone in the bottom right who's an engager, if they're under the pump or under pressure, their capacity to deal with reality completely goes out the window and they become even more in the clouds and the vision and the ideas and the creative stuff because, because that's their bread and butter. And um, for someone in the bottom left, if they are under stress, and here's where things sometimes you know, bunker down in churches, if they are under stress, they pull back and bunker down even more. And so they close the, the gates around their relational connectedness and they bunker down. Um, and for the top left, they become even more oriented towards rules and regulations. And so if they are under stress, and they will be under stress if their voice is not welcomed into the leadership conversation, they find safety and they bunker back into the rule book even more. And that's when you do get some of this legalism stuff at times you know, starting to be part of the, part of the mix. So when these come under, strength, under stress... <laughs> um, and again, it was a surprise to me because I thought under stress my strengths would amp up but they'd be even more welcome. Like Phil is really convicted about this. He is so passionate about this and people are going, oh, <laughs> duck for cover. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. But how do you engage that section of group of people? Top left? Bottom left. Yep. To get them into a place that, okay, we're going to move forward with this, everything's good. Um, you know, because if they are so relational, you know, they'll have many connections within the body of the church in so much that, uh, you know, if they're not feeling it, they're going to be talking. Yeah. Are you saying they don't have the relational connections? Are you saying they don't have the relation? Oh, yeah. Yeah. They are really connected. Yeah. 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 No, no. That's, that's not their bag. Yeah. Uh, I mean, one thing I mentioned that, that, that we started doing was, was the concept of focus groups that would happen before you'd have a strategic key meeting or a decision-making meeting. And so when you gave people the opportunity to come into focus groups, um, they turned up en masse um, because they wanted to, A, be in a place. They find a big vision meeting totally unrelational. doesn't float their boat. You know, we would have a meeting of, say, two or three hundred people and they're not feeling the vibe because, you know, even just saying, well, we'll have a cup of tea afterwards <laughs> doesn't cut it for them. They want to be connecting with people. And so the concept of focus groups, you know, strategically inviting them into the conversation prior to 
key decisions or strategic decision making to be made is a way of inviting them into the conversation because they're not, they're not wanting you to actually, and this is the thing that surprised me, I always thought they were against the idea. They're actually not against the ideas at all. What they struggle with is the impact of those ideas relationally on the community. And so it was a misconception of mine to think, well, you're just not on board, you're just, you're just against the idea. When, I, when you started sitting with them and started talking with them and inviting them to share what it feels like from their perspective and what, what sort of things do you think I as a leader might need to be aware of or we as a leadership need to be aware of, they're actually on board because A, you've connected with them relationally, B, they've connected with other people relationally and C, they feel like their voice has been heard. And they're not even necessary. I did not find that in a, in a focus group, they would sit there and say at the end of the focus group, OK, Phil, we've shared this stuff. What are you going to do about it? So they're not even seeking to try and change the direction. They just want to be connected and involved in the conversation. And there's probably a whole bunch of creative ways we could talk about here that says, knowing what we know about people, people, people in this area, how can we actually connect with them relationally so that they feel like they're part of the leadership conversation and they've been heard. With the top left group, they want a task. Give them a task. And so, you know, even if as a leadership team, I know in, in most of the leadership teams I've been part of and done profiling, there's a, on the strengths wheel at the top, there's this implementing category that um, uh, in most of the profiles I've done is actually missing. We don't tend to have a lot of impl well, I have not seen a lot of implementers on, um, on, on church-based leadership teams. A lot of people in the right-hand side, the persuaders, promoters, um, visionary people, but not many implementers. And so one thing when you know, we would do or I would, we would look at how we've got a project to do here, and we're talking, it might be 12 months in advance, it might be a, you know, a plan for two, the following year, we would actually get task groups going. And so this group love a task. And we'd say, Here's, here you go, guys, or men and women. Um, here's a task. Can you come back to us in three months' time and actually report to us and share with us what you've discovered? Because that group will actually go hard on what you give them. And they won't go away and say, well, we've been meeting for three months, had a cup of coffee. Um, we've had this really great time together. We've got nothing to share. They thrive on tasks. <coughs> Analyzing. Analyzing stuff. Um, costing it. Looking at the facts and figures type stuff. How does this information inform us as a leadership team so that we make wise, godly decisions? They love a task. They love a task. What about those people that you've got you might have in your church that are conductors that actually thrive when they've got the baton. What do you do with them? Let's say you've got 20 of them. So when they're sitting, when they're sitting listening to you, they're going, I could do that job. <laughs> I mean, when I go somewhere, I often sit there and go, I can do that. Because <laughs> that's how they operate. They just love having the baton. <laughs> Yeah, well, and then, and then, then you, they're sitting around thinking, I wonder when he leaves. Um, <laughs> what do you do with those people? Because if, if there's not space and room for them in the conversation, they'll dial out. So what do you do with people who are conductors there? They are the take charge people. How would you get them connected in the conversation? Get them, get them ten averages. Sorry? Bringing people ten averages. Ten averages? Ten, ten outreaches. Oh, ten outreaches, Okay. So you'd actually seek to put them in oversight of stuff? How, how would you involve them in the conversation? Because this is a leadership conversation. We'll come back to the, you know, the stump speech idea, presenting of the vision. You've actually engaged the top left. You gave them a task months ago and they've come back with some really insightful stuff. You've had some focus groups and you've met with you know, people and they're on board. Your bottom right are on board simply because they just love the, <laughs> love the vision and they love the emotion and passion that's a part of it. You've got 20 people there who are conductors who have not at this stage been part of any conversation. Give Sorry? Give me your ideas. Give me your ideas. What else? Give them a task that they've thought of or they've reported. 
give them information. Is that going to float the boat of someone who's a take charge person? Oh, there they do want permission to take charge. So how do you get them engaged in the conversation? What do you do with them? Apart from get rid of them. Because <laughs> I'm giving one person in charge. <laughs> In the old days, Barry. <laughs> How old are we talking? The evangelist is somebody who came into a church and the pastors were very happy to get rid of them as quick as they finished their preaching. Mm -hmm. All right, that was the old days because the evangelist was a danger to the pastor's perception of the mm -hmm. All right? um, I, I see some of that in Yes. Yeah. 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 Could be, yeah. Involvement in preaching vision. Ah. Now we're starting to talk about involve them in actually communicating the vision. In other words, get them into a conversation where they feel they are as much a part of communicating the vision as the senior leader is. Good idea. That's a great idea. Keep them close. <laughs> Keep them close. Yeah. Yeah. But also recognise that they need to actually be an oversight of something. I mean, we had a, at a church, we had someone who um, was uh, an overt conductor who was on the music team as a musician. Oh boy. You went to worship practice and because they weren't in charge, they fooled around the whole time. They were subversive in the way that they dismantled the practice. They were a pain in the blessed assurance. And the reason was... <laughs> The reason was that they were top right and they'd chosen to place themselves from a style perspective in a team where um, they had no, where A, their strength wasn't recognised and B, they um, had no sense of, of permission to actually, and I mean, I sat down with this person after doing their strengths profile and said, if you were leading that ministry team, what would you do? Boom, 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 boom. That, that sounds good to me. And he was, he was probably right. But because he was not in that place, he was actually um, subversive. And I went to a worship practice once and sat at the back and watched what happened. And he never said anything. He just fooled around. <laughs> did, what, did whatever he wanted to do. <laughs> and, you know, instead of the practice being over an hour and a half, it took three hours um, because he was just playing around because he wasn't in his sweet spot. And so, yeah, finding... That you know, I think that's a really good idea. How long would you allow someone like that to be? Two minutes. <laughs> there's, n there's no excuse for toxic behaviour. I'm going to tell you, there's no excuse for toxic behaviour in the body of Christ. Um, sometimes our forbearance is at our peril. Um, sometimes our I'm going to love this person through this. Um, is, um, is a terrible way to go. I mean, the hardest decisions as a leader are always the discipline um, decisions. Um, but, you know, um, I remember meeting with a pastor once who uh, had a member of their elders' council who was toxic and had been playing up for two years um, allegations of all sorts of stuff against this particular person and just being terrible. And I said, why are you allowing toxic behaviour? to be in your governing council of your church. I said, there is no room for toxic behaviour. You always act immediately when it comes to toxic behaviour. Um, you know, there's a wonderful leadership line, you get what you tolerate. If you tolerate toxic behaviour, you'll get toxic behaviour. Um, and again, you have to have the capacity to have those hard conversations as a leader um, for the sake of the mission of the body of Christ. And that's why I do some of the work with fierce conversations in terms of giving leaders tools to actually plan strategic conversations that need to happen so that they have some mechanism around them to actually have the conversations they need to have. Um, we had one pastor in a church I was leading who was, um, who was an alcoholic and so was his wife. And uh, this, this guy had been in the church for six, eight years as a pastor and I was new kid on the block six months in I had someone come to me and said look you know when this guy was praying over us on uh, Sunday night we could smell the alcohol on their breath and so you know I sat down with the guy straight away and said look you know you need to be up front with me do you have a problem oh no no I don't have a problem I might have had a glass of wine with tea and I said well look you know you can't be doing this um, 
I've got nothing against you having a glass of wine with tea, but if you're coming and actually praying with people who are vulnerable and hurt and stuff, and then the very next, uh, very next week, I had one of the staff members come and say, look, when this person came to staff meeting on Monday morning, he stank of alcohol. And so I took the guy aside and said, look, there seems to be an issue here. Um, before this becomes an act of discipline, you need to tell me what's going on. He broke down and wept. And, you know, it turns out he'd been drinking, you know, a couple of bottles of wine a night for a very, very long time. I went, tracked back through the, um, the history of the church and spoke with the previous senior pastor and said, look, we've got this issue and I think it's going to blow up in our faces. Was this there when you were there? He said, oh, yeah, it was there when I was there. I said, well, what did you choose to do about it? He said, well, I went and had a ch chat with them, but because they said there was an issue, I've just left it alone. And we discovered that people actually had left the church because they knew of that particular problem. Um, and so this pastor ended up being dismissed um, and I bore the brunt of that particular decision. But if you allow toxic behaviour to be part of the body of Christ, you will get toxic behaviour and you'll get it in increasing proportions. It's not just usually one person. When you give one person permission, you actually give the whole culture permission. Um, and you know, it's, that's probably a whole nother leadership conversation. <laughs> that's a huge conversation around, um, around behaviour. Um, yeah. You want to say something, Neil? I was going to say we need to... Oh, we need to wrap it up. We're oh. half No, we're not. Quarter past 11. It's only five minutes. That's sort of... From my strength position, that's okay. <laughs> I'm in control. <laughs> You're listening to me. We'll go for another hour. <laughs> Okay, look, can I just say just, a, just two really quick things in closing. One is that you obviously gauge for me that I'm very passionate about this and I'm very committed to it. I'm in a wonderful season of ministry where um, I'm able to minister without having to charge fees and all that sort of stuff. And one thing the Lord in part impressed on me um, about 18 months ago was that your commitment is to the body of Christ, it's not to the dollar. And so if, if you want to have ongoing conversations with me about any of this stuff, then I'm a servant of the body of Christ and I'm committed to this and feel free to talk with me. Um, I'm happy to come to churches or do whatever in terms of helping you know, work with teams and develop teams. Um, and um, I can make sure that we get my email out, Peter. And, um, um, and, and the other thing is that, um, as I said, the, the website is, is ministryinsights.com, one word, ministryinsights.com. Um, you can get online, see sample profiles and that sort of stuff. You'll also see that they're doing incredible work with marriages, with families, with youth. Um, you know, the, the breadth of this, this concept of the us factor and helping people live out of this unique strength is not just about leading churches. It's about helping families be whole and healed and helping marriages be whole and healed. So um, feel free to go online. I would say doing the profile without some sort of journey of discernment and working it through is a tough gig because it produces 28 pages of information and not everything you'll read on that page is you. And so, you know, one of the dangers of profiles is, is that they become your gospel about you. It's not the gospel about you. And there'll be certain things in your profile, if you, if you do it, you go, yeah, that resonates with me, that doesn't. And so it's designed to produce a picture and and I sort of say with people, you can do it on your own and that could be really helpful. But there's a, there's, because this is about us, it's a journey that is done together rather than as an individual. And so there's a context for it in terms of teams or families or church leadership teams or whatever. So as I said, more than happy to serve you in any way I can um, because, yeah, I'm really passionate about this. So thanks for allowing me to conduct you over... <laughs> over the last uh, few days. Can I just pray um, for you all? Um, uh, Father, we just really acknowledge the wonder and uh, beauty of your presence. We, uh, we thank you for the gift of your righteousness, which is, uh, which is Jesus. Our own righteousness is as filthy rags before you, but uh, his righteousness is perfect. His grace is pure. His love is limitless. Um, his sacrifice goes beyond measure. And so we thank you, Jesus, that you are our righteousness. And Jesus, in this whole leadership journey, as we seek to be leaders that are hunger, that are hunger and thirst after your righteousness, we seek to be in churches that hunger and thirst after your righteousness. Lord, I pray for every person here. 
that uh, maybe there's been some gems and some jewels from the last few days that go, wow, I think I can incorporate this into my leadership head and my leadership heart. And Lord, may we be committed to us. May we live by the us factor. May we be people that are not oriented to bring glory to ourselves in our own leadership style, but we want to bring glory, um, show the glory that is in, your, in the body of Christ. All in, all in. Bless everyone today. And we just pray these in Jesus, this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.